a succession of three talks. Um, one talk on, sustain, on the Sustainable uh, Forest Initiative by uh, Darren Sleep, who is a senior director uh, of the Con Conservation Science and Strategy at, um, at SFI, uh, followed by uh, a talk by uh, uh, Guy Robertson, uh, who is leader of the Sustainability Assessment Program at the US uh, Forest Service uh, about uh, sustainable forest management in Alaska. And uh, finally, we'll have um, our uh, second art exhibit uh, that will be led by um, Kessler Woodward, uh, who will talk about the importance of uh, collaborating with artists. Um, uh, Kessler uh, is uh, an emeritus um, uh, professor of art at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, okay, so this is for what's coming up in three minutes, in two minutes now. Um, and then after the three talks, <clears throat> we'll have a small break and two breakout discussions uh, going on. They've been formed this week during the discussions and the, and the previous parallel session. So one breakout discussion will be led by uh, Jill Johnstone from uh, uh, Saskatchewan sorry, who will uh, talk about the role of wildfire self-regulation as a predictor of um, future fire regime across the boreal region. And uh, the second breakout discussion will be led by uh, Georgi Alexandrov uh, from uh, the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences uh, on, and that will address the question of should management effort focus on maintaining spruce forests in the boreal region. Uh, Yes, so these, please um, yeah, join us for these discussions. They will be organized in um, uh, two breakout, separate breakout rooms. And then, yeah, I, I wanted you again to encourage to, uh, you to uh, fill out that um, form that uh, lists or identify the most significant publications both scientific and non-scientific uh, mainstream publications about the implications of climate change in the borough regions. I limited it to um, 2018, to publication after 2018. Some, um, some people yesterday suggested that that might be a little too restrictive. So I removed that. Uh, so you can just um, specify any publication from any time. Uh, on this topic that you think is um, uh, yeah, groundbreaking and, and needs to be relayed to the uh, community. So that's one survey. And the second survey uh, that I encourage you to fill out, and you have a link normally that was emailed to you yesterday. If you, uh, if you didn't receive that link, uh, please email, uh, email me or, 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 or use the chat box to let me know. Um, but you can vote for to support your preferred presenters, um, both uh, oral presentation and poster presentation. And your vote will help uh, with our final selections for awards. So please contribute and please uh, support the and don't nominate yourself despite what you, all the good things you think about yourself. The idea is to support your colleagues. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now I leave it uh, to Darren, so I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, Darren, you can um, you can share your screen if you are comfortable with that, or I can I can uh, move through your slides. Well, let's see how well this will work now. Yeah. Uh, can you see my yep. slides? Are we off to a? It's coming. Okay. Uh, just give it a second. Uh, uh has started sharing your screen. did you uh okay oh, one yeah. moment one okay well hopefully that will stay up it just gave me a warning that things were bad but uh okay no, yeah it's can, good we'll see how, we'll <laughs> see how far we get uh All right. thank you for the opportunity uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh sfi is uh proud to be a sponsor of the IPFR conference this year uh, and to to speak with you today, it keeps telling me that uh, Zoom is quitting. So uh, if this no, crashes, you know, you're good. Uh, okay, good. Uh, 
so, uh, you know, I, I guess I'd first like to start by uh, acknowledging that uh, I'm coming to you today. I'm, I'm actually in New Brunswick today, New Brunswick, uh, Canada, uh, the land of uh, the unceded territory of the, uh, uh, the Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet and the Passamaquoddy. Uh, this land uh, falls under the uh, Treaty of Peace and Friendship, uh, whereby uh, land was not actually ceded, but title was recognized for those, those peoples uh, living here since uh, time immemorial. Uh, with that, uh, I will say that I'm I'm uh, the uh, Senior Director of Conservation Science and Strategy at SFI. My role at SFI is to uh, support our conservation work through uh, both uh, running our internal investigations as well as our collaborative scientific work that we do with other organizations. And of course, this in turn uh, supports the various pillars and streams of work within SFI. Now let's see if I, oh, look at this, perfect. Uh, so uh, SFI's vision uh, is a world that values and benefits from sustainably managed forests, uh, and we do this uh, through advancing sustainability through forest-focused collaborations. And you're going to hear me use the word collaboration numerous times throughout this presentation because this is what this is sort of at the heart of what SFI does and how we work. Uh, it is our job, our role at SFI to engage on a number of relevant issues that, that you see here listed, and you can see how these would uh, easily translate across much of the boreal forest uh, in terms of growing future forest leaders, uh, climate and carbon, which I'll be focusing on quite specifically, uh, packaging for the planet and so on. You can see a, a number of uh, uh, relevant issues here that are key to uh, sustainable management within the boreal forest. Uh, we do this work, uh, we sort of parse our work into these, these four uh, pillars, these four different uh, areas of work. A uh, standard, which is uh, SFI is known as a, as a forest certification standard, uh, which is obviously a big part of our work, but we also work in, in conservation where I spend most of my time. But we also have a uh, focus on education, whereby we develop curriculum for K-12 uh, in the U.S. and in Canada. And we also have a, a green job and green mentors program here in Canada uh, that, that we are really working at developing that next generation of conservation leaders uh, you know, across North America and really across the world. Uh, and finally, our community engagement, uh, where we try and make sure that those communities that uh, live within the boreal forest and within uh, forest uh, forest um, industry communities, uh, the, the communities that really do benefit from not just the, the economics, but the, the, uh, the other benefits of the forest, the ecological and the conservation and the aesthetic benefits of, of those forests and the recreational benefits. So we, we work across these four pillars at SFI. SFI uh, is made up of uh, a three chambered board. We have our, our economic folks, which is obviously uh, primarily our certified organizations. But we also have our environmental uh, groups that participate uh, in our leadership. You can see these groups, that some, of them, some of which I'm sure you're very familiar with, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Nature Conservancy Canada, and American Bird Conservancy. And then finally, we have our, our pillar that is, is sort of the social component of our, of our leadership that uh, and these folks all get together. This is a CEO led board. So it's the CEO of these various organizations that help us set our direction and, and uh, lead us as we go forward. And, and we switch out, uh, I believe it's a, it's a two or three year term for each person or each organization. So these switch out fairly regularly. Uh, now, some of the things to think about SFI, I mean, these are just some general stats about us. Uh, you know, we have a, a huge scale so, impact. Uh, uh, you know, I think we don't see, we, we are still in your title slide. That's interesting. Okay, give me just one second. We will fix that. Okay. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was not sure. Yeah, I, no, we've had this, I've had this problem before, but hopefully we'll, what do you see now? I see a black screen saying Darren sleep, uh, nothing screening share, screen sharing. Um, uh, it's okay. Uh. Let me open your slides. I think I think I'll um, unless you want to try again, but I think I'll uh, I'll go ahead and and maybe share. Yeah. Okay. Okay. SFE has the scale to make a difference. Slide. And now you're muted. <laughs> oh no. Uh, I'll still unmute. How about now? How about okay. Now? <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy, uh, I'm I'm in a fair, fairly rural location, so I think the internet is is somewhat spotty. So hopefully it will last for the next 15 minutes, and and we can move forward. Uh, 
Uh, great, thanks. So, okay, as to the a scale to make a difference, you can see that you know at 375 million acres across uh, North America, what that means is any changes we make to our standard has this really large scale impact across our footprint. So we're we're really happy about that. We do we. Roughly, our SFI certified companies will do about 1.8 billion in forest research. We've done that since 1995. Um, uh, and 70% of those investments are allocated to conservation-related objectives. So uh, because we have a requirement within our standard to uh, have certified organizations actively involved with research, that means a lot of money gets driven into uh, active forest management research, which is very important. We have our our provincial, state, and regional SFI implementation committees. These are the grassroots organizations across North America that help implement the standard. And we continue to reach a lot of, you know, 140 million students since PLT began in the US. So we are continuing to have an impact, a very large scale impact across North America. And much of that is focused in the boreal forest. Um, we also know that, that it's not just us sort of whistling in the dark, but in fact, consumers are responding to this. We know that roughly from our market research, we know that you know, roughly 70% or so of consumers say that it's good to buy wood from uh, products that are managed from sustainable forests. And you know, again, about 72% of those say that it's a good idea to buy paper or cardboard products from sustainably managed forests. So because we have this impact at a North American scale, and because we know consumers are responding to this, it gives us a great opportunity to really leverage and harness the value, not, not the economic value, but the actually ecological value and the environmental value of our forests. But that's gotta be done in a way that is informed by science and, and, uh, and, and well thought out. And you'll hear me talk about some of those things today. Uh, I, we can also say that our standard is growing. We are increasing the, the coverage within North America. So this is uh, sort of a, a graph. You can see that green line is the SFI, the area managed SFI increasing over time. Uh, we continue to grow in North America and increase our, uh, the uh, amount of area that is covered. So, you know, between the consumers who are interested and our certified organizations that continue to join us, we are having more and more impacts. Now let's just focus a little bit more on the boreal. You can see here that this is a, sort of the boreal in North America. The lighter green is actually the certified area. So there's still a large chunk of the boreal forest that is completely uh, it falls within the unmanaged area. These are the areas that are, the dark green is the areas that are not currently under industrial forest management in Canada. Uh, but you can see the, the lighter green, this is the certified boreal forest. So there's a, a good opportunity to really, um, create not just economic benefits, but ecological benefits and conservation benefits on these managed lands. We recently went through uh, a standard revision process. I'm gonna focus on two particular objectives. You'll see here that are the ones that are highlighted, objective nine and 10, uh, but we've revised all of our standard in the last year. Uh, these, will, these new standards will be promulgated in January of next year, and uh, all certified organizations will be expected to meet these, uh, the, the new rigor of our standards. But in particular, because of you know, everything we hear about uh, changes to the boreal forest and how things have, have been going in terms of climate change, we really felt that it was important to work with our certified organizations to bring in these two new objectives, one on climate smart forestry and fire resilience and awareness. And I can say that uh, we put a lot of uh, effort and time into building consensus and working with climate scientists to, to find a positive way forward for our certified organizations to, to engage on these issues. Uh, just looking at the Climate Smart Forestry objective, this is the new objective nine, this is brand new to the standard. We already knew, uh, you know, from the work we've done looking at our standard, we knew that, you know, obviously science will tell you that forests play, play a critical role in addressing climate change. And we really felt there was a need to increase the global focus uh, of forestry and sustainable forestry on, on climate and how it could you know, work to uh, improve our odds or improve our, our opportunity to fight against climate change. So uh, as a result of this very strong direction we got from our, our certified organizations to do this. Uh, next slide. Um, the first thing we asked them to do, basically there's, there's two components to this objective. The first component uh, was to uh, get our certified organizations to really work hard to understand the likely climate effects 
on their landscape. So look at what is likely to happen uh, and then how significant those things are so they could focus their efforts and, uh, and adapt their management plans to those things that are really going to cause uh, issues for them. So this is a requirement for a certified organization to sit down and think through what the climate models say are likely to occur on their forests. Again, this is across North America, as well as obviously including the boreal. What are, what are the things that are likely to happen and how much of an impact will they have and can they adapt their management to the, those areas? Once they've done that, we expect them to report out on that, let us know how those plans are going and what they're doing to, to change their plans. And then we also ask them to identify opportunities to improve their carbon footprint. So be that reducing emissions in their operations or increased carbon capture on their forests, if at all possible. Uh, so this was a real strong uh, signal uh, both to and from our certified organizations to think about climate and how it affects uh, their forests. From a practical point of view, there's a, there's a number of things you can do in terms of adaptation, whether it's stand diversity management or assisted migration, obviously thinning can play a role. Uh, things like increasing culvert size to improve, you know, reduce the amount of blowouts, uh, for example, uh, that, that happen as a result of, of uh, you know, stronger or, or uh, so those 100 year uh, flood events that, that have been happening with increasing frequency. On the other hand, there's a, there's a number of things you can do on the mitigation side. Unfortunately, a number of those things are co-occurring. Thinning on both sides will help in terms of mitigation as well as in terms of adaptation. But we've really asked our certified organizations to think through how they manage their forests in light of climate change. The second uh, objective that was brand new within the standard in this revision was this fire resilience and awareness. Uh, again, you only need to look at the news for five minutes these days to see these increased uh, undesirable you know, wildfire events that are happening across the boreal. We know this is going to be something that's not going to go away. It's actually going to increase in frequency. So we really ask our certified organizations to do some work in those areas as well. So again, two major components of this objective. One is to look at their managed forests and figure out how they can reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfire and restore forests post-burn. And on the other hand, we ask them to engage with their communities uh, to think about education and awareness for the populations in those areas to increase fire smart practices in those communities uh, and reduce the risk of wildfire for everyone. So this is, this, this is a, the second major change to our, our standard in, in terms of fire resilience and awareness that we really built into it this time. Again, there's a number of, of practical things. You know, what, it, what does it mean? Uh, there's a number of practices you can put in. Again, some of these you know, work well with the climate smart things in terms of stand thinning, treatments to reduce levels of hazardous fuels, salvage logging, a number of things you can do on the you know, reducing risk or restoration side. And then a number of things you can do on community engagement. We're not asking organizations to reinvent the wheel, but in fact, to partner with organizations that are already out there doing things uh, to improve the education and community awareness uh, uh, with respect to wildfire. Uh, I'm going to, you know, shoot through the other three pillars of our work before I before I'm finished here. I want to talk obviously about conservation. Uh, we know that that conservation is an important part of what we do, uh, and we, you know, we work with a number of organizations looking at, for example, climate change and carbon. Here are the organizations across North America we're working with to better understand uh, the the carbon dynamics in in our managed forests, uh, including in the boreal forest. Uh, and, and to better understand how we can uh, improve uh, for things like uh, mitigation. Uh, so we know that in, in the lower 48, for example, there's a lot of uh, carbon stored in our SFI footprint. And there's a 235 million tons sequestered annually. I should point out these are all uh, CO2 equivalents. And if you break that down on a per hectare basis, 8.8 .8 tons per year per hectare across our footprint in North America. That includes uh, that includes, in most cases, fire, it includes the uh, wood harvested, it includes, you know, the sequestration in the soil and shrub layer and, and tree canopy. Uh, and we've not been able to complete this for the Canadian footprint yet. Uh, we've only got about 20% of the Canadian uh, footprint sampled so far. But you can see that there's even more stored just in one fifth of the Canadian SFI footprint compared to all of the U.S. Uh, but of course, because of uh, shorter growing seasons and colder temperatures, the annual sequestration is much lower uh, and, the, and the per hectare basis is, is obviously much no, lower. So it's very important that we work with our certified organizations, help them understand what they've got they're working with uh, to, begin, uh, to begin the work. Uh, 
but we've done this estimation and we know, we know that you know roughly the amount, if we just look at the SFI footprint in North America, uh, the carbon stored within our footprint is enough to account for about 30 billion cars in a year, which is you know actually more than 21 times the number of cars uh, uh, in, in the world. But that's what's stored in the, in the SFI footprint. And that, the amount stored is increasing over time. We've also looked at water to try and understand some of these metrics. Uh, the amount of water that, that flows through SFI certified land from uh, precipitation to runoff uh, works out to about 661 billion cubic meters of water every year, which is, you know, if you want to put this in some sort of a social metric, that's enough to sustain Niagara Falls for seven years. So we know that SFI, the, our certified land, has a huge impact on the amount of water uh, in North America and, and it's purified through our forests. We've also been working uh, with a number of organizations you see here on this slide to look at uh, OECMs or other effective conservation measures, uh, which are areas that will be set aside within managed forests across Canada. This is a Canadian and, and primarily boreal at this point initiative, uh, working with a number of organizations to identify candidate OECM areas that will be used to uh, support biodiversity objectives, uh, these are areas that are, have no likelihood of being harvested anytime soon, you know, long-term uh, uh, set-aside space, uh, because for those of you who don't know, Canada has this uh, goal of conserving 25% of their land uh, and 25% of their oceans by 2025, uh, working towards 30% by 2030. So this is some work we've been doing to help uh, certified organizations contribute to those goals. Within our, our communities, we feel you know it's, it's great that we're doing all this work in terms of sustainable forestry, and we're very proud of that work, but we really feel that those communities that are embedded within the forest uh, need to you know, see those benefits. If, if we're going to have a world that values sustainably managed forests, we need to make sure that those communities, it's not someone who just comes and takes the wood and, and leaves and you know, leaves nothing behind, but in fact, communities are engaged and involved. Uh, we've worked again, these are our implementation committees, these are grassroots organizations, uh, and these, these organizations, independent of SFI, have contributed $77 million since 1995 uh, to invest in training of, of harvesting professionals, outreach to family, family forest owners, environmental education in their communities, uh, in some cases just doing uh, things like uh, creating uh, engaging open air spaces, you know, parks, playgrounds, that sort of thing. So this is ensuring that the money that is generated through forest management actually contributes to those communities uh, as well. Uh, and we also work with indigenous communities across Canada and the US, over 120 different indigenous communities. Uh, we have a number of these uh, communities that actually have their forest certified to SFI and we are, we are you know, okay. continuing to engage and find, uh, find more engagement. We're also working to develop the next generation of forest leaders through various uh, green jobs training in Canada. So, you know, we continue to, to think long term in terms of our management of the forest. Finally, with, with respect to education, you know, we've got this goal of advancing environmental literacy, stewardship and career pathways using trees as a window on the world, which is, is really the, the key tool here. Uh, we've been working to place youth within green jobs. Uh, this is work that's been supported in part through the Canadian federal government, where we job match so that uh, companies pay basically 50% of wages and, uh, and grants pay for the other half. Throughout this project since 2018, we've you know, placed 3,700 youth, achieved gender balance, uh, and you know, worked with a number of employers across the SFI network. Uh, again, back to that Indigenous connection, uh, we placed over 580 Indigenous youth from 80 different communities in the green jobs. This is in combination with Project Learning Tree Canada, SFI, and the Canadian Parks Council. Uh, so this is some work we're trying to do to really think about conservation in terms of, of long-term youth engagement, uh, education, you know, reaching across all what you think of as the pillars of sustainability. Uh, and finally, for those, for those folks who have, who have thought about, uh, you know, uh, Literacy, I, I find as, you know, when I'm dealing with uh, adults often, uh, there's, there's some ignorance about exactly how forests work and what they do. So we've been developing this forest literacy framework to really help folks understand what forests do uh, and to develop age appropriate content across K to 12. So if you're, a, if you're an educator working with kindergarten or you're working with grade 12 students, you can find content that is age appropriate and useful in terms of educating uh, folks about, about forests. 
lastly, I'll just say that, um, you know, with the, hopefully the, the receding of, of COVID, uh, as, as, you know, we can finally get back to being in person, uh, we have our first in-person uh, SFI annual concert uh, Congress planned for 2022 uh, to take place in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, save the date. Uh, for those of you who have never been to an SFI conference, I can tell you it is, uh, and, and I used to say this as someone who went to a number of SFI conferences. Um, now I'm staff, of course, so I, I sound a bit biased, but it is a very good conference that speaks about sustainability across the supply chain, across North America, and usually globally as well. Uh, so our first one is planned, fingers crossed, June 2022, and we've even got longer term plans for May of 2023 in Vancouver, BC. Uh, so uh, please save those dates. If anyone is looking to reach me, here's my contact information. I apologize for the glitches at the first. Uh, hopefully uh, it still uh, was a useful presentation. So with that, I will stop sharing and uh, pass it over to Elen. Thank you very much, Darren. That's an impressive presentation, impressive numbers. Um, and uh, thank you again to SFI for their support to the IPFRA conference. Um, but there is no time for questions. We'll have to move on. So if you have questions for Darren, please use the chat box. And I bet there is a lot about, I had a lot. So yeah, please share your questions with Darren in the chat box. And we'll move on uh, to Guillaume Bertson from the US Forest Service um, uh, for a presentation also uh, on the uh, work of uh, the US Forest Service uh, in, in, in Alaska. Uh, so, uh, Guy, you can share your sc your screen if you if you want. Right, right now. Okay. Uh, and okay, yep, it's coming through. Oh, wait yes. a second! I have to do slide show. Okay. Yep. Pardon me. Give me a second here. Yep. I can't access the controls from here. So I'm going to exit back out. Okay. Stop here. Change the slideshow. I I think you can do that also once you share. Well, my apologies for this. No problem. see here that's the problem technology is always a, a problem here you mentioned slide from beginning uh -huh, this should work okay very good back here uh share screen click on that and share all right uh, well yeah okay perfect you can see your screen and it's presentation mode, you get to go. Okay, very good. All right, so thank you, Helene. My name is Guy Robertson, though I will answer to Guy. It sounds kind of nice in a French accent, but uh, I am Guy. Um, let's see, I work for the USDA Forest Service Research and Development Branch in the Inventory Monitoring Assessment Research Area. My um, is to uh, provide I guess you'd call it comprehensive assessments of sustainability at kind of national scale and especially reporting out to a lot of international processes, both in terms of uh, particular data elements and also in terms of overall assessment. As such, my knowledge is, uh, especially of the boreal, is a uh, mile wide and an inch deep, as we say. And uh, it is not comparable to the impressive knowledge that I've seen exhibited in many of the presentations over the last few days. So I beg your indulgence if uh, I'm being very general and maybe um, glossing over some important details. All right, so the outline for today's discussion, I'm going to be talking about um, Forest Service national policy uh, objectives and their relationship to the boreal. And I'll start with talking about the national and international policy context. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the US Forest Service priorities 
and I have them in quotes. I will explain why I am using quotes in the future uh, when I get to that slide, and then uh, uh, some conclusions and points to consider. And if I have a little bit of time, I might show you some specifics on our forest inventory activities and fire uh, suppression in the region. Okay, first off, in terms of the national and international context, I wanted to start with the Forest Service mission, which is to sustain the diversity and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. This is essentially a Brundtland type of definition. It's a, it represents a general commitment to sustainable forest management, but it encompasses contradictory social objectives and complex ecosystem dynamics. This sort of mission can generally be extended to the boreal forests, but because of the internal contradictions and the lack of um, agreement and, and multiple perspectives to sustainability, it is very easy to say this, it is quite difficult to do this in terms of attaining truly sustainable forest management. In, sense, in a sense, an important sense, it's not an outcome, sustainability is an ongoing process. Okay, now in terms of Forest Service engagement in boreal forests, for how, however, the Forest Service has few holdings in boreal forests. More generally, boreal forests in the United States are very remote and generally subject to minimal or custodial management. As a result, boreal forests have received little Forest Service policy attention at the national level. So when I'm talking about Forest Service policy today, I'm really talking about a more general impression of, of how the national policies relate to boil, as opposed to an official statement of Forest Service, um, Forest Service objectives and uh, perspectives or policy on boil forests in Alaska. However, there are several specific areas of focus for Forest Service activity in the boreal region. And the first is forest inventory activities conducted by the Forest Service FIA. Forest Inventory and Analysis Unit. Uh, we saw a presentation earlier today by Hans Anderson from the PNW Research Station along these lines, and I believe other pre presentations have been um, put forth. Another one, of course, is fire suppression related activities conducted in cooperation with other agencies. So fire suppression is a really, really big issue right now especially in the lower 48, but I'm sure it extends well into Alaska. And this is something that is dominating the attention of, of Forest Service as an agency, and also extends to many of the state um, forestry agencies. The BLM who manages much of the interior Alaska fire is a big deal. And then the last thing that I think is very important for the Forest Service is research of boreal ecosystems conducted by Forest Service research and development. And some of those researchers are here today or have uh, uh, presented earlier at this conference. And uh, I certainly want to recognize their work. Um, and yeah. So, and then finally, also climate change and G greenhouse gas management issues are uh, raised. Uh, you know, I'm kind of looking at this. I can't read my slides because I hope you all don't have the windows over on the side too that are obscuring the slides. No, I'll, I'll continue. We see the slides just fine. You see the slides just fine. Excellent. Okay, so climate change and greenhouse gas management are um, becoming more and more of a priority for, for the boreal region nat and nationally and internationally. This is something that might have changed a little bit from the last administration, but I, I think it's important to realize that the Forest Service is a large and not a monolithic organization. There are many different viewpoints expressed and um, and acted upon within the agency. And in the past, we have also been able to maintain a lot of our greenhouse gas management activities and other things. Um, and these things don't necessarily change immediately because of the change in administration. What does change sometimes is the rhetoric and the wording around. Okay, next slide. Okay, and another area that is important to me because I'm responsible to some degree for some of this international reporting is the international reporting uh, context. And this includes reporting out to the U United Nations Forest and uh, Agricultural Organization's Global Forest Resource Assessment, 
Also, one that I work with is the Montreal Process for Sustainable Management of Temperate and Boreal Forests. Notice how boreal is underlined there. And likewise, some other commitments. One of the points here, though, is I underline boreal forests in the Montreal Process, but many of the reports put out by the Montreal Process countries do not specifically delineate boreal forests. The same is true with our reporting to the UNFAO Global Forest Resource Assessment. So this question of how do you identify boreal forests, how is it statistically incorporated into international reporting is I think an important question for this group. More generally, we have uh, environmental reporting requirements through the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals that we report out on four specific um, activities or, or, or metrics to that process. The United Nations form uh, a UNFCC carbon inventory, which is um, something that has been maintained every year and, of course, has a strong boil component, and then other activities, various. All right, uh, now in terms of the national and international context, another area is uh, Forest Service international engagement. And we engage in various UN and related processes in which, um, yeah, in which the effort Forest Service is engaged. One of those is the UN FAO North American Forest Commission uh, and other working groups associated with the UN FAO and especially the Global Forest Resource Assessment Process. These include uh, a recent workshop on trying to identify, um, trying to identify uh, forests in the boreal, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the name right now. I know this is, well, I'll go on. Okay, and the other one is the UN Forum on Forests, but most notably is the UNECE FAO Team of Specialists on Boreal Forests. Now, the UNEC is the UN Economic Commission for Europe, but it contains the USA and Canada as member countries. This was a carry-on of what prior to this uh, development of this team of specialists was the Circumboreal Forest, um, Circumboreal Forest Working Group, which we uh, participated in. I was on that group and, and helped out with the establishment of the Boreal Team of Specialists. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, now we're moving on to the question of forest service priorities for boreal forests. Now these are not, I have them in quotations because these are not official. This is a sensing of USDA forest service priorities and their relationship to boreal forest management. One of the areas that doesn't get spoken of too much but is still very important is biodiversity conservation. And that is related to unique and charismatic fauna in the region a wild mystique that is held by many people in the lower 48 and also highly motivated national stakeholder groups that uh, leverage lots and lots of donations. And I'm an economist by training and those donations represent concrete willingness to pay for environmental goods, in this case, biodiversity conservation. And uh, it is an important area and something that is still very strong in uh, much of the national perceptions of Alaska. Another area is indigenous and local peoples. And here we have a very high degree of cultural and economic in integration with natural systems. These include cultural, uh, social uh, amenities in terms of recreation, but also a lot of economic uh, activity, including income splicing and uh, engaging in different relationships with the forest at different times during the season. This is uh, in many ways, this degree of integration is hard for someone like me who sits behind a computer and works a nine to five job for a number of years now to imagine. It's a very different lifestyle and the forest and its composition is, is integral to that lifestyle. And uh, the inclusion of these peoples um, into the planning process is very important. Now, let's see, next we have forest disturbance processes. I mentioned fire before, but there's also insects and the various other ones that have been talked about at this conference and management response and strategies for remote sparsely populated regions are something that needs to be considered. And then finally, climate change. And yes, we have been talking a great deal about climate change at the international and national levels. The Forest Service is um, uh, 
motivated and sincere about its desire to, to address climate change, especially through forest management and forest enhancement. Now, to the extent that that actually comes into play will be a question of uh, resources, allocations, and some of that needed. And I see that I'm out of time. So I'll just move directly to the conclusions. Some questions or conclusions that I'm having, I had for, for this uh, presentation. First off, and this was related to what I was saying about the FAO forest resource assessment is uh, the definition of delineation of boreal forests in national and international reporting. How much is needed? Currently, my understanding is that most of uh, the definition and delineation is mostly by forest type. But if we're talking about boreal as a bioregion with contiguous boundaries that can be summed and aggregated over the entire biome, then that's a different story and that, that probably needs different definitions. I'm not sure what the status is there, but I think it's an important point to consider, especially if we're going to try to put it into the FRA or other international reporting networks. Secondly, ways to better include indigenous and local perspectives in management and, and policy decisions. Uh, the citizen science uh, um, presentation earlier today was an excellent example of that kind of activity. But from my time uh, working in planning in, in Southeast Alaska, I know that planning, forest planning and management plans are a long-term, grueling, difficult process with lots of conflict entailed and usually dominated by professionals. It is a difficult uh, arena for local and indigenous people to operate in, and we have to make sure that we, we gather those perspectives and, and, and uh, successfully uh, reflect them in our planning activities. Development of better models, management models for co-production of biodiversity ecosystem services and greenhouse gas management. This has been talked about, I think, before to some degree. And then finally, trade-offs and opportunity cost in investing in management and boreal forest as opposed to elsewhere. This is an acute question for management. For example, if we're looking at carbon sequestration schemes and trying to engage in active management, we really have to ask ourselves whether the boreal forest is the best place to make those sorts of investments. All right, Helene, I had these for time allowing, but I might as well go to the end. Okay, so that's the end. Thank you very much. I must say that this photo is from Lake Kathleen in Yukon Territory, Canada. It's the one I had a picture of. I guess it's close to Haines, Alaska, so close to the United States, but I thank my Canadian colleagues for providing this excellent landscape to in my presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Guy. And again, sorry for the mispronunciation of your name. Um, uh, and thank you for um, the support and uh, the sponsorship on the on the conference. Um, that was uh, uh, extremely helpful. And um, yeah, thank you for the great uh, presentation. Um, again, if you have uh, questions for Guy, uh, please use uh, the chat box. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you could uh, stop sharing your yes slides, uh, that uh, is great. Okay, thank you very much. And so now um, we'll have our second art exhibit of, of the week um, with Kessler Woodward, uh, um, um, emeritus uh, professor of uh, art at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, so, Kes, uh, do you want to do screen sharing? I'm trying to do that right now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, share. I'll zoom to share my screen. Oh, geez. Let's see. Hmm. Any 
Hmm. I don't know why it's not working. It, okay. you know, well, it always works. Uh, yeah, it, it worked well with the uh, for the uh, IDOC work uh, workshop. Uh, do you want me to maybe share your slide and you can tell me uh, when to move on from one slide to the other? Uh, I guess. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, if you let's, would. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, hop. And then hop, uh, and I do presentation. Okay. Presentation, come on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm Kes Woodward. I'm an artist and art historian and museum curator in, in Fairbanks. I am gonna to talk to you today, not so much about my work, but about why as scientists, you might want to collaborate with artists. And I wanna point out a number of reasons. Next slide. Artists bear witness to the world. Artists imagine things. Art is powerful. Art is insidious. All art is narrative, and there is no such thing as an objective image. Next slide. First and foremost, artists bear witness to the world. As Oscar Wilde cleverly points out to us, artists see things, call them to our attention, and help us to see them in new ways. Next slide. As I pointed out in a paper I gave at one of the very first carbon dioxide induced climate change conferences held here at the University of Alaska almost 40 years ago in 1982. Oh, wow. Believe that I'm not done until 16:30 on Friday. Please, uh, please mute yourself. Thank you. A few climate scientists over time have noticed some of the ways that climate change is specifically chronicled in the work of artists. W. J. Burroughs in the journal Weather in 1981 presented evidence that the period in history in which winter landscapes first played a major role, the middle of the 16th to the middle of the 17th century in Flanders and Holland was ushered in by cooling of what we know now as the Little Ice Age. Burroughs pointed out that snowy winter landscapes were virtually non-existent before the Flemish artist Peter Bruegel the Elder painted this painting, Hunters in the Snow, in 1565. But the painting was followed by a century of work in Flanders and Holland in which winter scenes were a major genre. Most people worldwide, even today, think that climate in Holland is much colder than it actually is because they've seen so many famous paintings like Bruegel snow scenes and others of skating on the canals, not realizing that that was not common before the mid 16th century and hasn't been since the mid 17th century. Climatologist Hans Neuberger made an even more um, Yeah, sorry. I'll tell you when to. When to yes, sorry. Before. Okay, climatologist Hans Neuberger made an even more specific reference to artists whom he called chroniclers of their environment and of the climate. He surveyed more than 12,000 paintings, assigning numbers for the degree of blueness of the painted sky, the percentage of cloudiness and the like. He found a close statistical correlation between painted meteorological features and different climatic conditions in various regions. Next slide. These are, famous art, uh, these are famous artists, of course, but artists bear witness even when they're decidedly non-famous ones like these. Next slide. I wanna tell you about something called the Tempestry Project. In January of 2017, days after President Trump moved into the White House, a man named Justin Connolly was at his home in Anacortes, Washington, worrying about the fate of scientists. In speeches, the president had called global warming a hoax. He'd vowed to disband the EPA and withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords. And Connolly and others feared the Trump administration would purge climate information from government databases. Next slide. Mr. Connolly had a friend, Emily McNeil, who worked in a knitting store. The two of them decided to assemble a kit of colored yarns that knitters could use to create scarves that documented local temperature changes all year. They would access data reported by NOAA, which knitters would represent in specific prescribed colors ranging from various shades of yellow to red to blue. 
Connolly and his colleagues call this the Tempestry Project. And in a very short time, they sold more than 1,500 kits worldwide. A woman named Eric Zambello at Audubon, Florida began organizing volunteers to record temperature changes in US national parks. And scarves were soon knitted on behalf of 30 national parks, among them Glacier Bay here in Alaska. My point here is that there are many ways that artists bear witness to the world, always unconsciously and often intentionally in the process of making art. Next slide. Besides bearing witness to the world, artists imagine things. The image on the upper left is a 700 year old artist's vision of evolution. It comes from an illustrated manuscript published in the 14th century. I happened to notice this image in the February 12th issue of Science Magazine this year. It was appended to a fascinating article about research on the genetic development of limbs that enabled fish to climb onto land. The illustration on the right from the same article shows what we now know to be the evolutionary sequence. But both the author of the article in Science and I were struck by how an artist responding to a Dutch poem envisioned the evolutionary process 700 years before. Next slide. So artists see things and imagine things. Next, I want to assert that art is powerful. The artist we know as Caravaggio was not a religious person or even a good person. He was a thug. He died at the age of 38. He was arrested 11 times. He was a murderer. But as much as any pope, he saved the Catholic Church during the Counter-Reformation by recasting biblical stories with images of people from his own time, using dramatic lighting never before seen in painting before his time to bring the biblical stories to life in the Counter-Reformation. Next slide. This is Theodore Jericho's Raft of the Medusa. It brought about a change in French government when it was shown in the Salon of 1819 by embarrassing an incompetent Navy run by a newly restored French monarchy after Napoleon's defeat in 1815. Next slide. And this is Liberty Leading the People, which commemorates the July Revolution of 1830, which toppled King Charles X of France. That's Lady Liberty leading the very group of rioters, and she became the inspiration for Frederick Auguste Bertoldi's Liberty Enlightening the World, the sculpture we now know as the Statue of Liberty. Next slide. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, yep, yeah, that one. <laughs> More than any scientific report or survey, Thomas Moran's paintings convinced Congress and the American people that the land which was about to be leased for cattle grazing was worth saving as this country's and the world's first national park, Yellowstone Park. I give talks regularly about how the work of prominent 19th century artists gave rise to the conservation movement in America and to the establishment of nearly all of our first national parks. Next slide. Powerful, eye-opening images of this sort continue to be made by artists today. This is Alexis Rockman's bleak, futuristic image of the Brooklyn waterfront. It imagines the toll of global warming as ocean water submerges the city and makes a ruin of its infrastructure. Next slide. So art is powerful, but it's also insidious. Words invite disputation, but images creep sneakily into our minds without our noticing. The battle over drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge has been fought much more intensely and effectively in images than in words. Every pro-drilling image uh, looks north towards the bleak landscape. Every anti-drilling image looks south. Every pro-drilling image looks uh, shows winter and every anti-drilling image shows summer or fall. Next slide. Over and over, caribou are in the anti-drilling pictures. Next slide. And when caribou are in the pro-drilling pictures, we see caribou happily, contentedly with uh, oil wells in the background. Next slide. Now those images, of course, were propaganda for both sides, but 
actually all images are narrative and there is no such thing as an objective image. Elin, um, we, uh, we got a late start on my presentation uh, uh, and I'm, I'm at my time. Can I go on for just a Please few minutes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you probably don't think this big Sidney Lawrence painting uh, of Denali in the University of Alaska Museum is a narrative painting at all, but it is. And the fact that we don't realize that demonstrates how insidious the power of art is. Next slide. So what does, Sid, what does Sidney Lawrence painting say? All my adult life, I've tried to convince people who look at paintings or other works of art to ask, not what it is, a, what is it a picture of, but what does it say? Next slide. Sidney Lawrence's paintings say that this is a place with no people. Next slide. And when there are people, they are tiny. They're large and grand and powerful. It's a dangerous image that Cindy Lawrence gives us because what it says is that the landscape and the land is invulnerable. Next slide. His contemporary Eustace Ziegler painted the same scenes as Sidney Lawrence, but with him, people are always in the foreground. Next slide. What Eustace Ziegler says is that the land can be conquered. It can be mapped. We can even extract resources from it. Next slide. He says one more thing though. He, he says he does paint people and his paintings say that Alaska is a harsh place where people have to battle against the environment and it's a place where the environment takes a heavy toll. Next slide. Finally, one more beloved Alaskan landscape painter, Fred Makatans. Look at the quality of light in these paintings. Look at the character of the people in these paintings. Fred Makatans learned from Inupiat hunters with whom he lived and hunted in Northern Alaska that this is a place where people who work with the environment can enjoy it as a paradise. Today, uh, next slide. Today, contemporary artists continue to tell stories about Alaska and about the boreal forest. I would urge you to take a look at work about the boreal forest by artists who live here in our part of the boreal forest. I would ask you to ask yourself not what is being depicted, but what do their images have to say? Next slide. And look not just at paintings, but at work in a wealth of other mediums. Next slide. These are just a few in various mediums and in mixed mediums. Next slide. And the next slide. This is, uh, th these are a few examples of my own work. I have been making large scale paintings of elements of the boreal forest and of the forest itself for more than 40 years. Next slide. Much of that time, I have been artist in residence for the One Tree Lab here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which studies the impact of climate change on boreal forest in general and birches in particular. Next slide. We can look, but the boreal forest, as we know, is far larger than our part in it. And I think it's important to look at what artists are doing in other parts of this world's largest terrestrial ecosystem. Next slide. We can, we should, we can look to artists of the boreal forest in other parts of our own country. This is just one group of botanical artists in Minnesota. Next slide. And I think we should look beyond our country to our neighbors in Canada where artists, writers, and musicians have been telling stories about the boreal forest for years. Next slide. This is just, this is a post about just one of those projects with a chamber or music consortium. Next slide. And we should look beyond our continent for ideas, inspiration, and opportunities for collaboration. The United Kingdom, for example, is rich with artists devoted to telling stories about the boreal forest. This is just one group devoted to foraging in the forest and to making art from their foraging. Next slide. These are just a few of their workshops. Next slide. 
Also in England is this group, Inhabitat, whose motto is design will save the world. They combine art and environmental activism and have a more ambitious vision. Lockheed Martin and a group called Aerial Forestation Incorporated took an idea from a former British Royal Air Force pilot. They're outfitting C-130 aircraft originally created to, among other things, drop landmines to instead drop up to 900,000 trees a day. They are evidently, there are evidently 2,500 of these C-130s sitting unused around the world in 70 different countries. It could make for a lot of little saplings and a burgeoning boreal forest. Next slide, final slide. After all, as the great anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss has reminded us artists, when he claims to be solitary, the artist lulls himself in a perhaps fruitful illusion, but the privilege he grants himself is not real. When he thinks he's expressing himself spontaneously, creating an original work, he's answering other past or present actual or potential creators. Whether one knows it or not, one never walks the path of creativity alone. The same is true for you, our scientists colleagues. I would urge you to look at us not just as vehicles for better public understanding of your work, but as collaborators with you, treading the path together in research about the boreal forest. Thank you.